Welcome to episode seven of Show and Tell. And just to remind everyone quickly, we can be uh, found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the Show and Tells are on our website. So please check out previous episodes as well. Uh, so uh, as you can see, I am wearing a completely unstructured jacket today from LVM 1911, which is a company in Italy. I don't know, I'm gonna try and get close if you could see. Uh, it's got an incredible geometric pattern uh, that I just love. And because it's unlined and the fabric doesn't really wrinkle, uh, it is just the ultimate travel uh, blazer. And to add to that, they have patch pockets right by the hip. So very easy to just throw in your boarding pass, your credit cards, loose papers, what have you. So it's the ultimate uh, travel blazer and I like to pair uh, this brown blazer with gray trousers always goes perfectly uh, next up I want to show you drivers from Scoroso I just absolutely love these uh, they're really the true definition of just laid-back luxury and elegance uh, it could be worn in a myriad of different ways uh, you could actually even wear that with just a t-shirt and jeans of course, with a blazer or just a button down, it's just so versatile. Um, you could really wear it pretty much four seasons also because the leather can withstand some of, you know, inclement weather and stuff like that. So uh, Scoroso is unbelievable. Please check them out if you're into footwear. Uh, they make so much good product. Uh, my favorite penny loafers are from them. Uh, these drivers that I have, I mean, I'll be wearing all summer long and beyond. So check them out. They're one of my favorites for sure. Next up, this was a real treat to get in the mail. Hold on, guys. I got these from Mont Fortuna. Uh, all double bands, as you can see, and one Cohiba. Not so bad. So a lot of limited editions and special editions. So that's incredible. Um, they are amazing. Uh, they're an e-shop. They can deliver you uh, straight to your door, Cubans, and they have so many different options. You can get lost on their site. Um, you know, I love that they have samplers like I just showed you, or they have full boxes and just like I said, a myriad of just different product to choose for. So if you're a cigar aficionado or aspiring one, please check out Mon Fortuna and their website. They are unbelievable and they're my go-to when I want to get Cubans delivered to my door without having to travel back to them. So, with them, excuse me. So, uh, for my manufacturing tip uh, this week, uh, we're gonna be talking about finishing. And when your product is ready to ship, you know, always have your manufacturer send pictures uh, of the product to you, and also ask them for pictures of how they're packaging the product. And that's really important, because sometimes if the garments are not protected, uh, when they're in cartons and they're being uh, transported, if there's a lot of heat, colors can bleed on each other, your product can get ruined, you lose a lot of money, a lot of time, a ton of energy. So in order to protect against that, I always ask um, how it's being packaged. Sometimes I request poly bags or different types of finishing for different types of product. Um, but this way I ensure, even if it's a few cents more per garment, that your clothes or your accessories are delivered in perfect condition because like I said, otherwise you could be in for a disaster. So it's best to avoid them. So without any further ado, Hey Tyree, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. What's up, man? How you doing? Pleasure to uh, talk to you today. I'm very excited. Thanks for taking some time out. I'm extremely excited to talk yes, to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks yeah. You know, I know <laughs> that everybody knows that you have, incredible skills on the field. What right. they don't know is that you have, I'm going to say right now, could be the most swagger in the whole NFL. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. Well, you got to let other people say that, not you. So, <laughs> so anyway, so we have a normal format for the show, but I'm going to kick it off with some questions that I just couldn't wait to ask you. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. What do you think? So you had two touchdowns in the ASC Championship. That's mm -hmm. like storybook stuff. Like, I mean, can you imagine yeah. growing up a kid, as a kid and being like, touchdown, we're going to the Super Bowl. Like, right. how was that moment? Uh, and, like, do you have any really good stories from that game? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any good stories, but I will say the moment was, like, so, so like, surreal for me. 
Yeah. You know, like it was almost like I was a, a walking vegetable at the moment because I couldn't believe like <laughs> like I was scoring, like who was going to the Super Bowl, you know, so it's still like the moments still still haven't hit me yet that like we've won the Super Bowl. Like I'm yep. still like, you know, like we gotta go back and win that thing again. Like, you know what I'm saying? So yep. and maybe like Corona like has has like has um done um had um its effect on it, but maybe it'll come once I see that ring. When I see the ring, then I'll be like, "Ooh, okay, I got some jewelry on my bank." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But well, that's coming soon enough. And speaking of the Super Bowl, I mean, 105 yards in the Super uh-huh. Bowl, and I, 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 the play that really sparked the comeback. I mean, I think that's unquestionable. Yes, um, sir. You know, what is it like being a Super Bowl champion and how did you celebrate? Uh, Well, like I said, like, it still hasn't hit me. And um, Mm -hmm. the way I celebrated it, um, I just spent time with my kids. I spent time with my family, you know, Mm -hmm. um, the ones that supported me, you know, from thick and thin. So that's the way I uh, celebrated, you know what I'm saying, with my kids. I Uh I just ended up taking my kids to, like, Disney World or something. Nice. You know? So. Well, I love that you're a family man, and we'll talk about that a little later as well. But uh-huh. we know that you have made uh, the Pro Bowl. You've made all pro first team. Um, yep. Like, I, I know you're a team first guy. I've seen a lot of media you've done. Um, but, yep. like, was that a little bit like, wow, you know, I've kind of arrived a little bit. Was that a little exciting for you? Oh, yeah, man. Um, being a special teams guy, like, coming mm-hmm. in as just a special teams guy, man, it, it was like, man, like, I really have to change how people look at me, you know, because people don't really, like, respect you if you're, like, a great return, like, which is crazy. Like, I respect, like, I respect the hell out of, like, Devin Hester. But I feel sure. like, like, well, I feel like not enough people give him his credit, you know what I'm saying, when it's due. Like, he was a fucking hell of a player. Like, he yep. led that, like, he helped that Chicago Bears team to the, to the Super Bowl. Totally. You know what I'm saying? So, with me being me, you know what I'm saying? My mom, like, she always taught me, like, if you're going to play, if you're going to play football or, like, you're going to do anything, you know, you're going to be, like, you got to be great great at it, you know? So I work my butt off, man, like, each and every year to, like, improve, you know, to make all pro, to make pro bowls, you know what I'm saying, to make the all-decade team. Like, I work my butt off, man, because those are the goals that, like, um, those are the goals that um I set for myself, you know, mm-hmm. once I, like, entered the league, so. I'm like I'm steady growing. I'm steady improving as a player, as a, as a father, man. Like I'm steady growing. So the uh, sky's the limit for me, you know. Yeah, of course. The next two questions are the ones that I couldn't wait to ask. So, okay. um, what is it like to have people rock your jersey, man? Like when people when you just like see that, uh, like okay. what's that like? You know what, man? Like, the first time, well, the first few times I saw people rocking my jersey, like, it was at a mall or something. Like, I was like, man, I got to go sign those. You know what I'm saying? Because, <laughs> like, this is like, this is like, man, this is like the biggest thing ever. You know, but as the years went on, I was like, man, I'm starting to see, like, too many jerseys. I can't be signing everybody's jersey, <laughs> man. <laughs> I can't be, hey, you want me to sign that for you? I can't be doing that because it's like 40 people. It's like crazy now, man. But that's definitely an amazing feeling, man, when you walk in. Like, let's just say, like, I'm in the Virgin Islands right now. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And, like, somebody walked by me with a Tyreek Hill jersey. I'm I'm going to feel I'm gonna feel good as hell. I'm going to feel proud as hell. Yeah, man. Like, it's a man, blessing. Like, like, I really, like, inspire that person or, like, I'm his favorite player, his or her. So. Yeah, that's incredible. What a blessing. Yep. So, I know you're nice in Madden. Do you, yeah. use, do you yeah. use yourself? That's that's the question I couldn't wait. And yeah. how dirty are you? <laughs> I don't, like, so, like, when I play Madden, I don't use myself because I would, like, force myself the ball, like, every play. Every time. <laughs> and when I, like, generally when I play, I play with the Bears or I play with the Dolphins. Like, I try to use trash teams. Yeah, okay. You know okay. what I'm saying? I, I like using those trash teams. Well, that, teams, that shows man. that you're better if you're beating somebody. That's what I'm like, saying. Like, I feel like, I feel like I shouldn't have to use the Chiefs or 49ers or Patriots or Cowboys, I shouldn't have to use those good teams to show. So you're trying to take their soul. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to take their soul by beating them with Mitchell Trubisky or <laughs> Ryan Fitzpatrick or somebody like that. Not saying those guys are good, 
You know what I'm saying? But it's just the way that mm-hmm. it's just the way that Madden rated them. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So Yeah, totally get you. So uh before we transition to some off the field stuff, mm-hmm. um what is your best Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes story, being that you're close with both of them? Oh, my my best Andy Reid story. Yep. Oh man, it's that's like you caught me on the spot, but my my best Patrick Mahomes uh-huh. huddle story is like this dude came into the huddle like I believe it was practice or or, or, or like it was a, like it was like a preseason game. No, it was practice. Uh-huh. He came into the huddle. This was like the first time anyone ever heard him say a play, like the very first time. So it's me, Kelsey. You got uh, D Rob in there. You got you got like it's a bunch of like people um, who gonna laugh in the huddle. You know uh-huh. what I'm saying? Because we goofy and, like, we love to giggle. So, Pat come in the huddle. His first time coming in the huddle. He, like, so, like, um, he looked at his little uh, play sheet on his hand. He was like, uh, do you like this? Bro, the funniest thing I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. Like, I couldn't even run the route the correct way because, like, his voice was so freaking funny to me, bro. But now, like, man, we all used to his voice, man. And he goaded, so. We did. We don't pay no no attention. But I don't got no Andy Reid story for you though. Huh? Okay. What's my name? That's it. See, look, he came up to me. What's my name? Tyreek. Tyreek. Yeah. Tyreek Hill. Yeah. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you man. Nice Love to meet that. You, man. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. See, look, I'm really sitting here, man. You know what? You are the first person to get live fan love on our show. I love it. <laughs> but check this out though. I'm in. I'm in. Uh, I'm in uh, San Juan. Uh huh. I'm in San Juan, like, uh, and they and still know family. you. Not, give me like, give me like 15 minutes. Yes, sir. So that's amazing. You're in San Juan and people are recognize you. So yeah. your, your nickname is Cheetah as a reference to your speed. I wanted to know who gave you that. And if you've ever put thought into running for the Olympics and I've heard you touch on it. a little Oh bit. yeah. Yeah. So the cheetah name, it kind of originated, you know what I'm saying? Cause my favorite animal is the cheetah and you know, and my, and, and my grandmother, like she used to call me um, Bo growing up. Like yeah. my, my grandma, she used to call me Bo because of Bo Jackson, you know, so oh, Bo nice. Jackson, yeah, Bo, Bo Jackson Jackson's fast. Animal. He's he can play every sport and I I I'm fast I can play every sport too so then like when I got into when when I got into high school you know what I'm saying like my name was both all through our high school when okay. I got the Oklahoma State it was still both my rookie year of um for the Chiefs mm-hmm. like she was like she was like you know what we gonna change your name to Cheetah you know what I'm saying instead of both you know what I'm saying so. I've been rocking with Bo every. I mean, Cheetah ever since. Like I changed, I changed everything to Cheetah, man. Like e- even Coach Reed called me Cheetah. I'd be like, uh, you know what I'm saying? So the whole building called me Cheetah, and that, and that's where it started from, man. My grandmother. She are we gonna stuff. Are we gonna see you run the Olympics? So believe this or not, man. I was gonna, I was gonna start training for it this year, but but uh, obviously, I mean, with everything going on in the world right now, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. Everything being pushed back, I'm just gonna wait till like next year and do like world championships or something. Yeah. Wow. So it's in the works, man. Like I really, I, I like I really thought long and hard about it, you know. Cause I mean I'm young, I'm fast. I wanna like I wanna I wanna be doing something in my off season besides, you know what I'm saying. And that would help. That that would help. Right. You in football. I mean, a hundred percent. Right. So right, so that's great. And so plus, man, I love competing. I love competing, man. Everything I do, I love competing at the highest level. You know, even right, though so I, even though I may not win, I love to compete. And talk all right, so it. now it's now it's time to embarrass you a little bit. So, <laughs> so style is all about confidence, right? Right. And you heard me mention that I think that you have some of the best swagger in the NFL. Right. Uh, my question to you is. Uh, how do you um, how do you get ready for game day, and do you consider yourself having the best streetwear style in the in the league? And um, how would you describe your style? I mean, well, as far as the game for me, you know, I feel like um, like I used to believe in look good, play good, like before mm-hmm. the game and all of that stuff. But for me, like I feel like my streetwear is better than anybody's wear. You know what I'm saying? Like well, I said before it. the game. Before the game, I really don't get dressed up though. I just throw some on, you know, 
Cause, cause like usually like I got my kids, I gotta get my kids ready, I gotta get everybody ready, mm-hmm. you know. So before the game, I, I just throw some on. But if I'm like, like let's say for instance, like me and you and like a couple of friends go to like Prime Prime One Twelve. Prime One Twelve is like a fancy yeah, restaurant, right? Yeah. So we go to Prime One Twelve. I'm gonna throw on something crazy, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna throw on something like you never seen before. You know what I'm saying? So my streetwear is crazy. It's just I, I don't before games I. I'm I'm like here and there with it. Do the kids come to the games with you? Yes. Oh, that's great. So, uh, like when you are getting dressed, even though you're just kind of throwing on something quick, so then I guess it probably uh, matters like where you're playing, right? Because you right. obviously got to dress to where that is. Right. I mean, to where you're playing. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So, can you talk about your clothing brand, Soul Runner? So, um, Soul Runner, man. And great like, name, by the way. Thank you, man. Uh, just trying to correlate it like with what I do. Soul running. So soul running, man, like it started, you know what I'm saying, in high school, you know, mm-hmm. um soul being like the essence of the spirit and the running being like mm-hmm. a part of my life. It's being it's, it's symbolic to life. You know, but if you wanna go if you wanna go like a little bit deeper into it, you know, um do you do you know what um mumba mentality is? What, what Kobe of had. course, yeah, Kobe. So, so like I look at it like that. Like I feel like Soul Runner can be like my, well, is my persona. Like when I'm on the field, very you know, cool. Um, I'm Tyreek Hill, off the field, cheetah, cheetah, and Soul Runner mentality on the field. Very you know cool. What I'm saying? So, I just want to create a brand, man. Like, mm-hmm. like I, like I just want to be a part of something that can leave a legacy. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like with my smarts and and like, and like my team smarts, like if, if we come together, like we can do something special. Love so it. Soul Runner was it was like what it was. You see, I'm rocking some. I'm rocking some Soul Runner gear right now. Love it. Everywhere I go, you know. And if you guys want to be a part of the Soul Runner brand, you know, it can be a part of y'all lifestyle too. Like I want it to be a part of everybody's lifestyle. But remember this: you got to be accountable. You got to do the right things, and you got to have integrity to be. To be the, to like to like um be a part of the solar one brand you know love that so so uh what kind of like silhouettes it's going to be t-shirts hoodies like what are we looking at oh yeah it's going to be uh hoodies joggers um workout attire it's going to be it's going to be all kind of stuff man so, great can, can you for, name- uh, oh sorry continue oh go go ahead go ahead uh, can you name some of your brands other than Soul Reiner that you like rocking? What do you mean? Some like other just brands? clothing brands that you that oh, you like? Uh, oh, cool. Man. Uh, I like Fear God. I like um, Fear God. I like Balenciaga. I like Fendi. I wear uh, Louis Vuitton. What was I wearing yesterday? I, I was wearing some crazy shit. My girl had bought it for me. It was nice. fire though. But yeah. But some of the stores I like to shop at, I like Top Man, I like Zara, I like uh, All Saints. Oh, so you mix high and low, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I respect. So it. like, so so what's crazy is I may go in Zara and find me a shirt, go in All Saints and find me some pants to dab it up with. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. But the way like everything going on right now, though, I've been doing like a lot of online shopping from this from this place called uh, Boohoo Man. You you ever heard of that? No. Baja Man, it's it's something oh, like okay. that. Okay, yeah, yeah, Bo- Boohoo Man or something like that. Bo- yeah, like they got some crazy stuff on there. Like they got a hey, che- cheetah on uh, swim trunks. I just ordered some. Oh my god, they like they so fire, man. So they got some good stuff on there. Dope, very cool. We got to yeah. show you. We actually made a grungy gentleman made a tracksuit, and it's got trim uh, with cheetah running down it. I'll oh, send I got to after. I got. I got to get it. I got to get it then. See anything yeah. with cheetah? I got to have it. You know it. So being drafted in the fifth round, uh, do you think that helped you in the long run? I mean, obviously on draft day that might have been a little difficult, but right. you know, did that put the proper chip on your shoulder? Because now, in my opinion, you're one of the best receivers in the league. You are definitely right. the best in special teams in the league. So you proved all the doubters wrong. Well, I mean, I definitely agree with you. You know, I feel like if I would have been drafted in the first round or second round, I would have just, I would have just basically took the easy way out. You know, um, being drafted in the fifth round um, really, really gave me that fuel that I need to propel my vehicle. 
right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I came in behind a lot of guys. You know, um, they even drafted a receiver before me, Demarcus Robinson, who was my greatest friend on it. Well, one of my best friends on the team. You know, so I was even behind him on the on the depth chart. So, I I came in, man, with a different mindset, with a different mentality, saying that I'm 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 going to take everybody's spot, even the starter, if I got to. Yeah. And look at me now. So, yep. So a guy as talented as you, how did, how, like, how was it training for the combine? Was that kind of easy? Because you're faster than everyone anyway. I mean, training for the combine, like, there was a lot of things, like, I had to work on, like, for my 40. Like, yes, I was fast. I was running 4-2 every time. But there was, like, you can get 4-1 if you run a proper technique. And I ended up running, like, a 4-2-1 at my, my uh, pro day. But, yeah, like wow. <laughs> the training, like you gotta you gotta stay in shape, you gotta stay strong because you gotta you gotta do bench press, you gotta do broad jump. Like I can do that easily, but I wanna be better at it. You know what I'm saying? So that's the reason why I was going every day. And plus, like I said, I love to compete. Like we had guys there, you know what I'm saying, um, who was also fast, who who could also broad jump the same as mine of me. So I would love to show up and like compete with those guys so um so we can push each other each and every day. So yeah, the great ones always want to get better. So that's not surprising to me at all. Oh, yeah. So uh, do you feel a sense of responsibility to break down barriers with race-related issues? Do You said, do I feel like it's a responsibility? Uh, like you feel a responsibility, you know, to sort of break down barriers, especially with what's going on right now, and sort of raise awareness to race-related issues? I mean, I feel like, I, I feel like this. I feel like if it's in your heart, you should do it. If it's not in your heart, you know what I'm saying? Don't do it. You know what I'm saying? Just because everybody trying to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Me being me, I'm going to support Black Lives Matter till I die. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Because I want change. And everybody who's my color wants change. And also, there are some white people out there that want some change too, though. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, I personally do. Um, so let's have a little fun. Are you a watch, cigar, or a car guy? What would you describe yourself? I would say all three if it was me. <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say, can I say all three? <laughs> but uh, I, would, I would have to say Cigar Guy, man. Yeah? I gotta say, so, I, 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 I got to say Cigar Guy. Because I'm not really a car guy, but I, I am a car guy because, like, man, I got, like, five old school cars. I, so I am a car guy, but I, like, also got, like, a bunch of cigars lined up in my crib, though. So Nice. Uh, can I ask you what kind? What's your favorite brand of cigars? I'm a big cigar guy myself. Man, look, I, I I don't I don't know the brand of them. I just go outside and pretend like I'm blowing smoke. Word. Can I give you <laughs> Can I give you a suggestion, quick? Come on, give me one. All right. So I'm gonna give you two. Um, there's this brand I love. It's called Davidoff. Unbelievable. Uh, if you want really? a really luxury cigar, uh, they're actually not I mean, made in I mean, Cuba. They're mm -hmm. made in DR, but. Okay. I've never had a bad draw once in my entire life as far as smoking them. And what they do is they break the cigar up into three different parts and there's wow. different, and there's different flavors as you continue to, you know, smoke it. Unbelievable. If you want a relaxing experience that, you know, okay. you just want to enjoy. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. And you know, one day if you're ever out. in New York or something, maybe we, I could take you to the shop and they have a cigar lounge. It'd be really fun. Okay. Um, and then the other uh, I'm going to hold you up on that. Yeah, for sure. And then the other suggestion, which you, you're going to love this. Cause you remember you said you do a lot of online shopping now? Yep. So the first e-shop e that's allowing you to buy Cuban mm -hmm. cigars, and they have every brand from Cohiba on down, uh, uh -huh. it's called Mon Fortuna. Um, and uh, they are absolutely amazing because you could basically get any cigar in the world delivered to your door. Um, so that's I love crazy. that. So as far so what about cars? Anything that interests you there? I mean, like I said, I got a lot of old school cars. I got a seventy five. Well, I'm a vintage car guy. So you like vintage? This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I got a, a seventy five Mustang. I got a seventy Nova. Woo! I got a seventy four Bunnyville. I got a uh, I got a seventy two Charger on the way. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm into like old school muscle for real, man. If you old school muscle. And like new school muscle too, though, because I got a 2016 Hellcat. So I'm not into like Lamborghini trucks. I'm not into any of that stuff, man, because that's like a waste of money, I feel like. 
Oh, well, I love that you like vintage cars. It's like my number one thing. Unfortunately, my fiance, because we we're going to have kids eventually soon, she said it's not going to be good for kids. So I got to, uh, I got to, I'll have you message her. <laughs> tell so her look, I got, look, I got kids, but I never let my kids rob me. Like if I'm going like on the straightaway. Now, mm -hmm. um, now, um, me and my son, Zev, like, like, um, we'll go down the dirt road and um, do some donuts real quick and come back home. So he love to do donuts. He like, daddy, can we go do donuts today? All right, let's go. Let's go do some donuts. This is so, amazing. I, I take him to go do some donuts. Oh, man, that's great. So after you signed your $54 million extension, uh -huh. what, was your, what was your biggest flex? And how did you feel as your life obviously changed financially? Uh, my biggest flex was yep. I didn't I didn't have a big a big flex and for real man for me like I'm a real southern guy guy I, I I grew up driving tractors I grew up you know what I'm saying old school by raised by my grandparents so like I'm very I'm very cheap I'm very uh frugal with my money so I didn't I didn't do nothing like I was just like man I'm ready to work I want I want more that's it that was my mindset. You know, I was like, you know, man, line me up right now. Like, I'm trying to get five years for, for like, 100 mil next time, mm -hmm. you know. So that's my mindset, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's the way my parents always raised me, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, it's because you – oh, go ahead. No, no, I mean, it just seems like you have just a drive to just get better and improve in everything oh, yeah. you do. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I'm gonna have my fun. I, like I said, I'm in San Juan right now. I'm, I'm gonna have my fun. But when I'm working, when I'm grinding, and I'm trying to reach a certain goal, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like I got tunnel vision. You know what I'm saying? That's great. So, all right. So the number one question I was excited to ask you: How many times a day do people say to you that you're on their fantasy team? I <laughs> mean, man, look, they. <laughs> Everybody I see almost in America, like when I be walking through airport, they'll be like, I picked you number one fantasy. I'm like, no, you did not pick me number one fantasy. Can't that many people pick me number one in fantasy. Can't that many people pick me number one in fantasy. You may pick me, but not number one. I don't know. You, you're going in the first two rounds, though. I'm telling you. that I think you are. Okay. Is that what people mean? Like, I picked you well, like, no, no. first I round? Mean, they're probably or... kissing your ass a little bit, you know. But, I mean – you're up there, man. I mean, you know how many players there are in the NFL, and you're going in the top twenty every time, pretty much. I don't know, bro. I don't, I don't pay attention to that fantasy stuff, man. Only thing I know is our wide eye group is saving fantasy fantasy teams across America. Our wide eye group, cause that's what we do. Well, our Chiefs offense is saving fantasy teams. Word. So, who wears you out more, your kids or defenders? <laughs> <laughs> uh, gotta be defenders, man. Cause all they do is just talk. This this how they do all game. They just talk all game, man. Yeah. If you play, if if, if you play against a good DB, he, he's gonna talk your head off the whole game. Just, just trying to get in your head, like even at the line line of scrimmage when you line up, he's trying to get in your head, and it's like ridiculous. So I be like, man, can't can you like just be quiet and like get routed up real quick? Cause you can't guard me, bro. Words. So. How is it? carrying your son around during Super Bowl. I saw it multiple times throughout the weekend. That must have been special to share with him. That was fun. It was definitely fun. Um, he definitely had a chance to, like, you know what I'm saying, see it for himself and just have fun and, like, be a part of, like, the Chiefs, the, like, the uh, Chiefs kingdom. You know, um, he was able to come in the locker room after the game. Like, he really enjoyed that. So I was just happy, man, like, just to have my son, my family there with me, you know what I'm saying, to, like, my, my biggest moment ever. Winning the biggest game ever, you know what I'm saying, and just having your family there is just so. It's like, it's just like you said, as a kid, like this is what you dream of, like waking yeah. up on on Sunday morning, hearing the the music, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that, that that's it, that's what you dream of, like when you outside in your back backyard, age eight, imagining making big plays in the Super Bowl, then winning the Super Bowl. That's what, that's what you they dream like that, like that was me as a kid. I used to visualize a lot, like me playing in the biggest game making the biggest play, and then having my family there. Like, as a kid, I was like, yo, I want to be just like that dude. <laughs> like, even though, like, Randy Moss never won a Super Bowl, I was like, I want to be just like that dude. Well, Randy like, Moss. Was, 
Randy Moss is definitely goaded. And I hope you have a picture printed out with your kids from the Super Bowl and your whole family, I do. for that matter. I do. I do. Good, good for you. So rumor has it that you have serious bounce. And I wanted to know, were you ever considering basketball over football? And um, uh, who, who, and who do you root for in the NBA? Uh, I never considered basketball. It's just something that I like to do in my pastime. You know, because um, um, one of my friends, he owns a gym in Kansas City. So, I mean, as soon as we done working out, running routes, um, we play basketball because uh, he trains, like, the KU players. Mm -hmm. He trains NBA players. He trains, like, a lot of guys. So, like, they be needing, like, another player. So, I just hop in and then I be cooking them, you know. So, they be like, hey, <laughs> you probably can be the next Nate Robinson. Nah, I would be like, nah, I'm the next Tyreek Hill if I go to the NBA. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> But yeah, but my favorite team is is uh well my my favorite player is Damian Lillard, by the way. Oh, he got the NBA 2K cover. Uh, did you see that? Yes, I did. So I'm very proud do you of my play, boy. Do you play NBA 2K? Yeah, I do. I do. By play the way, NBA 2K. so listen, I'm gonna hold you to this. Grungy gentlemen, clothes that I designed are available at Swags in the neighborhood. I need you to hold me down. All right, all right. I got you. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. But yeah. Uh, Damian Lillard is my favorite player, man. My favorite player. I got, like, all of his jerseys. I got all of his jerseys. Like, I don't even do that. I don't even do that for nobody. I don't do that for LeBron, like, Jordan, nobody. Shaq, nobody. But, yeah, that's my favorite player. But my favorite team has got to be the Clippers, though. I, I got to I gotta say the Clippers, man. Yeah. I got to say the yeah. Clippers, man. So you think they're t you think they're taking it? They just so like well balanced, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They got Patrick Beverly, I I like a three and D guard, you know, they got Paul George, they got uh Kawhi Leonard, they got Lou Williams off the bench. That's six men out and, and you know Lou Williams, he's gonna give you a bucket. And then they got Montrez Harrell. Come on, man. Like it don't get no he's better a, than that. He is a great like five two like he can he can do everything. He That's he's what gonna I'm saying. rebound, he's gonna hustle. Yeah, he's gonna get after it. Yeah, the only problem they got is with the Lakers, man. That, the Lakers, man. I just – you know LeBron going to be LeBron in the playoffs. He going to go for 40, 10, and 15 any, any night. He just yeah, giving. Like, he just the like that. Yeah, the Lakers and the Clippers are the favorite. My dark horse, and I don't know if they're going to do absolutely unbelievable and, like, surprise people or phase out quickly is the Mavericks because uh -huh. uh, I think that their team is pretty solidly built as two for a playoff game because they can go inside-outside pretty easily. Um, you like you like the Mavs? Uh, I don't. I mean, I think the Lakers and the Clippers are the favorite. And as far as the East, obviously, I would go with Milwaukee. Maybe Miami would be a dark horse, but um, I guess we'll phone. see. Okay. I, I I guess we'll see soon, though. <laughs> yeah, we we definitely have to see soon. All right, so I have three quick questions left, and I and I really appreciate your time. You have been unbelievable. So, Thank you. Uh, who has been? Who's like the toughest guy that you have to go against that guards you on defense? And then who's the toughest team you guys have ever had to face? So the toughest guy, I get you Like guys. basically the toughest corner and then the toughest okay. team that you play. So the toughest guy I probably went against was probably Jalen Ramsey or Marlon Humphrey. Sure. Because Jalen, because he got them long ass arms and Marlon because he's like fast and he's aggressive and he can move too. So he's fundamental and he's, and he's also like, he's also a technician too. Like he's also good with his hands. Yeah. So, in the hardest team we played was probably – so, the hardest team we probably played was, like, the 2018 Ravens. That was the hardest game ever. Like, the fourth and nine catch, that was crazy. Yeah. Because, like, I had got injured in that game. And, like – Well, they're physical. They, their defense – their defense was, like, physical. Like, when they tackle you – you know, you knew they tackled you. Like you, you come back to the sideline, like coach, man. I, I, I gotta get out of bounds next time, don't I? Like you, <laughs> you, like you questioning, like this is the inner, like this is the NFL game right here. You know what I'm saying? So them, yeah. them Ravens, man. But they lost a lot of players. Though. Like they, they lost C.J. Mosley. They lost Terrell. So they lost a few key guys on the inside. So we'll see what happens with them next year. Yeah, no, yeah. and and the, the last. The landscape is changing, too, because Cam is obviously now New England, so that's going to be pretty crazy. Nice. Well. That's going to be real crazy, man. I'm real happy for Cam. Yeah, me too. Um, so on the next episode uh, that's coming out for our show, 
We uh -huh. interviewed uh, London Brown and Donovan Carter. Uh, they're from HBO Ballers. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that The Rock, at the end of the uh, show, became part owner of the Chiefs. I was wondering, obviously, that's... Part owner of the what? Well, uh, for the, in the show. In the HBO, show, in the show. Yeah, he becomes he, he part owner. the Chiefs. Ooh. So, well, <clears throat> that's kind of the reaction I'm looking for. So, who would you like to be, like, part of the Chiefs organization if you could have your pick of anyone in the world? If I could pick anyone, Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you, hey, you asked. Is it shoot Rihanna? your shot, no problem. I agree. Rihanna, I'm shooting my shot every game, and then guess what? I'm playing hard every game. Worried. So, Rihanna, if you're listening, please make sure that you make yourself out to a Chiefs game for sure, because Tyreek wants to talk to you. Yeah, uh, no, nah, no, nah, bro. What you said was part owner. Oh, okay. You want her to be a part owner? Yeah, she a part owner. So that okay. way, if that so that way, if me and her do talk, then I can be like part owner of what she got. So then it'll be, oh, it'll nice. be collab, we'll collab together. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hey, I really dress up for games then, though. <laughs> work, 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 work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So last question. I might slide one quick one in if this is the fast one, but that's about it. So should the NCAA play uh, pay players? And if, you, and if you think so, how much do you think they should pay people? I definitely think the uh, NCAA, the NCAA should, play, should uh, pay players. You know, or like let them earn money or something, man. Cause, cause, uh, cause, like as a college athlete, man, like it'd be hard as hell. Like, like a lot of people be like, "Oh, man, you're getting your school paid for," but you don't know what I'm coming from, though. Like most kids, like like most like like uh, most kids be like project kids. Like them be the best athletes. Them them uh, project kids, like kids, like kids. Kids without a dad, kids without a mom, like stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So those kids, they don't be having no money. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like the NCAA should, should like pay those players and allow those players to earn money for themselves. Because the university, they already earning bukus of money. You know what I'm saying? So what is that gonna hurt them? Like I don't, I don't understand it. You know? Got so, it. So to wrap up, so on if open. not. If not, though, I just feel like they should change the rule on the NFL. Like, just let the NFL, I mean, on, on college football, just let college football players, just let college football players play two years, too, instead of instead of playing the whole three years. Because, you know, in NBA, you, you can you can play, you can play zero years and go right to the NBA. Mm -hmm. So. So you think the rules need to be adjusted a little bit? Then right, some need to happen or letting them people earn money. Off, off they likeness, cause they, cause the 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 university earning money off, off they likeness. Got it. So, uh, very quick, and this is just a name, okay? Cause I have a good way to end it in a second. Uh, right. Who do you think has the best style in the NFL other than you? Oh, definitely Kelsey. I, I thought you were gonna De say that. Definitely Kelsey, or definitely uh, I will say Cam Newton. But some of his outfits be looking kind of funny. So I'm gonna say Cam though. I'm gonna say Cam though, because I like Cam. All right, so this is the last question, and then I'm gonna, if you don't mind, just do a 10 second outro with you on here, and then we'll just be done. So, okay. uh, and thank you, you've been unbelievable. So, uh, what can we expect next from Tyreek Hill just in life, and what can we expect next from the Chiefs? Uh, well, I'm, well, I'm gonna go ahead and answer the Chiefs. What you can expect next is to see us in Tampa next year. That's what you're gonna oh, see right. us in Tampa. So, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You're gonna see us in Tampa, but from Tyreek Hill. Uh, hopefully on the cover of magazines, man, with my clothing brand. Like, that's one of my goals. I want, I want to start going to, like, fashion shows and stuff like that and promote my brand even more, you know, because, mm -hmm. like I said, I want, like, I, uh, I want this to be a lifestyle, and I want this to be, like, a huge brand, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that can eventually turn into some. Like, those are my goals for myself by the end of this year. Well, so, luckily, you're talking to someone who's a runway designer, so maybe I can help with that and maybe do a collab and put it right on the catwalk. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about, man. Hey, we got good swag. Hey, if you want to check out any Soul Runner gear, just go just go to your search bar and type in Soul Runner, y'all. That's all you got to do, and you'll see all kind of designs. And our, fr uh, our first drop is going to be at the end of July, I believe. You know, so get ready to cop what I got on now at the end of July. You know Love it. Man? 
Love it. So I'm going to do the quick outro. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, guys, sir. if you want to uh, follow Tyreek, it's Cheat on Instagram and check out his clothes, uh, Soul Runner. Um, if you'd like to watch the full interview, you can watch it on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, our website. Tyreek, you've been amazing. Can't wait to see you in Tampa, like you said, in uh, February. Hey. Yes, sir. I'll see you in Tampa, baby. All right, man. Speak to you soon. Yes, sir. What's hey. up? How are you? <laughs> I'm good, man. What's going on? I am so excited to speak with you. You know, I, I mentioned it on Instagram stories. I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are. And I repost, I re, uh, re put it on my, um, my stories. Yeah. What's going on? I mean, well, uh, everything so far so good, especially okay. during these trying times. How's everything with your family? Everybody's good. No complaints. I, well, you know, we can't complain and, you know, no one's out of work or anything like that. So it, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. And everyone's healthy. Well, that's most important. I agree. Yeah. So I have a normal format for the show, but there's a couple of questions, about five of them, that I can't wait to ask. So, are you cool <laughs> with, so is it cool if I start real fast? Yeah, go ahead. So like I said, you know, on Instagram stories, I had mentioned that, in my opinion, you're the most successful and the most influential male model ever. So wow. having said that, <laughs> so having said that, you know, when you were in Zoolander, you absolutely were the biggest model on the planet. So mm. did they ever ask you for any advice when it came to writing and authenticity? And are there any cool stories as far as with Ben or Owen that you could share? Um, we were given a script and, um, you know, after a while, we, we did so many takes. They let us do a couple freestyle takes. So it was really, really good to to be able to kind of be yourself in that movie, mm -hmm. you know, because um, I was playing myself. So, you know, when I showed up on set, you know, these guys hadn't seen me in a while. They, you know, they saw some old pictures of me. So at the time, they used to see in me like this. So mm -hmm. I showed up on the set with long cornrows. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so Ben was like, uh, is, uh, that's the new look. I said, yeah. He's like, all right, we're going with it. So, you know, in between takes, I just sat in my trailer and played video games. And, you know, it was, it was such an easy set to work on. And, you know, we had the, the late, great um, David Bowie on there. So that was mm -hmm. fun. I mean, if you look back at it and you see how many people are in that one little scene, we had um, Mark Ronson. Uh, DJ Mark Ronson, and in between, you know, takes he would spin music. So it was kind of like a, a club party atmosphere. Awesome. And then it was just it wasn't like work, you know. It was it was really fun. We shot it upstate New York, and you know it was it was fun, man. Awesome. So everyone knows it's well documented that Ralph Lauren helped propel your career when he chose mm -hmm. you, you know, for yeah. to be the fake to be the face of Polo. Uh, yeah. Can you please tell us something that Ralph has done that you respect that's outside of choosing you? And then um, do you have any other cool Ralph Lauren story that you'd like to share with us? I'm a huge fan of his, so that'd be cool. Okay, so um, one thing that I do love about Ralph, um, recently he, he spoke about um, Black Lives Matter. Yeah, um, I saw that on social. Yep. Yeah, and then also uh, he's a, he's – you know, he spoke up about pride and, you know, the LGBTQ uh, community mm -hmm. and uh, can't forget the trans. Um, yeah. So he 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 spoke up about that and he, you know, he made special shirts and, mm -hmm. you know, I wish he would have made some Black Lives Matter shirts. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be, that'd be very cool. But, um, yeah, he definitely he's, you know, he's older gentleman now, but he still some way, some form, he's still connected, you know? He still mm -hmm. knows what's what. And, you know, um, being a kid from the Bronx, he just, you know, he gets it. He understands that, you know, we, we, can't, we can't have a, a, a garden full of one-colored roses, you know? Sure. The garden must have other flowers and, and things of that nature. So you can't mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, class people into to one box and not get along you know so what i do love about the guy he's he, he's he's so down to earth um a story that i have about me and him like uh one day he came in you know he's and i was doing a fitting 
And he came in and he's like, wow, you look like you're in good shape. And he goes, you don't have abs like me. Then he lifts up his shirt. No. And I mean, this guy's got like, he's got like a six pack. What? Like, yeah, he's, he's in good shape. Like, you know, and then, you know, I showed him mine and he was like, okay. And, I, and he was <laughs> like, you know, when you get to my age and, and, and still have it, then, you know, you're really saying something, which is true, you know, to be as old as he is and to be as, in good shape, you know, no beer belly, no, no fat, just, you know, you could see the ab muscles and it's like, wow, I guess he's still, you know, he, I guess he's still training, you know? There you go. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a good it. inspiration to see someone like that still going at it. You know, he's not, he's not some fat CEO who doesn't care about what's going on in the world. He, he cares, you know? Yeah. That's very powerful. So I know that your mother was your manager for a while, and she was an incredible. Uh, no, actually, my mother wasn't my manager. My oh, mother's just my mother. Yeah, everyone well, thinks Beth Ann Hardison is my mom sometimes, and uh, I w we would always go somewhere, and she's she's always been like my second mom, mm -hmm. but she's always been my manager first, and then you know my second mom second. Oh, that's know? great. So, but your yeah. model, your your mother was a model as well. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, my mother was a um, – actually, she was a beauty pageant uh, girl, and she was uh, running for Miss Jamaica at one point. So, yeah. Did she serve as a role model a little bit to you as far and give I, you I would I would say, yeah, she serves as a, as a role model. Not so much the beauty pageant side, more so mm -hmm. the the hustling mom. Like, you know, there was, <laughs> you know, there was so many of us. You know, I, a lot of people think it's just me, but I have um, – I have two sisters and three brothers. So for me, it was like, I'm the middle child. So I kind of got forgotten. So <laughs> I'd have to like, you know, do things. And I would put on like shows, friends would come over and my mom would have me like, wake me up <laughs> to go downstairs and dance for them on a school night or whatever. It's just, you know, so I was like the kind of the, the performer of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, I was definitely the black sheep because I did everything different from everyone else. So well, you, had, you had to make a little extra noise. It's no big deal. Yeah, yeah. I had to make a little extra noise because I got otherwise I got lost in the crowd because, you know, it's <laughs> either the older ones got love or, or the younger ones got love. The middle one was kind of like, you know, I was on my own most yeah. of the time. So, um, yeah, she definitely was a hustler. And to this day, we I speak to her probably several times a day. Mm -hmm. You know, just because, you know, we we, we don't often um, spend uh, physical time with them. So as much time as I can spend with her, even on the phone, just talking about what's going on in the news. Uh, yeah. We ha we constantly talk about Trump, you <laughs> know, and what he's doing wrong and what's wrong with him. So we have those conversations and then we just have mother-son conversations. And, mm -hmm. you know, the other day I was telling her about, uh, you know, having issues with, with, with broken hearts and what does one do with a broken heart and how do people get over it? Not to say that my heart is broken, but we just, we just talk about all kinds of different things, you know. But we rarely talk about my other siblings. When, it, when I'm talking to my mom, it's me and her time. I'm not sharing her with the rest of those other, t other kids. You know? uh, that's but, funny. Well, the yeah. good news is you definitely didn't get – left in the mix you became the biggest supermodel on the planet so. oh yeah no she's so proud of me she like she likes to go pull back some of my old school pictures of my mm -hmm. early model days like when i was like five and six she used to dress me up and do like have her friends come over who were photographers and shoot me yeah and yeah the other kids never liked it but for me it was cool because i got to play roles and stuff she would give me an idea and say all right act it out so when I really look back at it, she was nurturing me into becoming the the supermodel, the actor, the producer that I am today. And I, I, I guess I really wasn't really paying attention back then. But when now I look back at it, and when she sends me pictures of me of you know when I was younger, mm -hmm. it it really brings back a lot of memories of you know learning things and you know, looking to, into the camera, you know, and I think like when I think about it, I was smizing way before I even knew what that was, you know? Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah, she's definitely a big influence on my life. Well, that's great. And, you know, I know that you're mixed race. And I was wondering yeah. if, um, you know, you feel a certain level of responsibility um, to break down barriers. And one thing I must commend you on, which was fantastic, you're so ahead of your time, was when you did take a stance when you were in Milan about mm -hmm. um, basically yeah. black models not getting casted. And you took a hard stance, basically boycotting it temporarily. And Yes, um, I did. And, yeah, you know, that, 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 that was, was, that was tough, man, because... Here I am, I'm not even, I don't even think I was even six months into the model business. And, you know, I had started getting like so much traction in such a short time because I blew up within a year. So mm -hmm. once that was going on, they were like, you know, a um, couple of guys I knew went over to Milan and it was a normal thing to go, you know, once you did New York, you went to Milan, Milan to build your career and your book. Sure. So once I had heard like they weren't hiring or they didn't want to see black male models, I, I, I said, and they only wanted me to come over. I said, no, I'm not doing that. If it's not all of us, then it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm definitely not coming over there. So I took a stance. A lot of the designers got upset and was mm -hmm. really, you know, really upset with me and, and my stance. And, but I almost was like, did I just ruin myself before I even got started? You know, but I don't I've always been political and outspoken to the point where when I see something unfair for others, I'll, mm -hmm. you know, I'll sacrifice myself, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And, you know, so many designers were mad at me. And I said, you know what, I'll just stay in America and just work. And, and that's what I did. I even I just turned up the pressure on myself and said, look, you just ruined it for Europe. So don't think about going there now while everyone else is there. So do you think this helped? Do you think this helped get I think Ralph's it did. attention? I think it did. I think it really did at the time because after that, the next thing I stood up for was just plain racism in fashion, which it was almost like I was outside of of the GQ building with a sign saying, you know, uh, it's not fair that you know you're not being racially equal to everyone for jobs. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like I was making a stand before it was even cool to speak yes. about racism in fashion. And then uh, at the time, it was the uh, gay men's health crisis who were going through it. They were, you know, gay men were getting beat up. Uh, lesbians were getting attacked. And it was like, I stood up for that too, way Good before that was even cool. And the reason why I stood up for that is because there were so many people that I worked with, like makeup artists, um, stylists, um, you know, my own cousin was gay. And it was just like, and I started to see them getting picked on for like no reason. And, you know, it's, and I, I really believe that it's a born thing. It's not something you just say, wake up one day. Okay, I'm going to be gay today. It's in you already. You just haven't either embraced it or haven't gone through it yet. So for me, Watching my cousin uh, embrace it when it wasn't cool. Like we would go somewhere and it'd be all of us. I mean, we would tease him, but we would tease him playfully. We never teased him in a point where he broke down and he cried or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So for somebody else to come along and try to do that to him, oh, well, I wasn't having it. Plus, I was like, uh, I was a tough little street kid. So I wasn't having it. You And, you know, you ain't going to you ain't going to pick on my big cousin. So. I, I, I stood up that. for him many times and, and I watched the whole uh, community go through that during my time, you know, being a fashion model. And it was just, you know, in the nineties, it was rough for, for uh, gay people. And I didn't think that was fair. I mean, being um, a straight person, I just was like, why are you picking on him? It didn't make any sense because it just was like, you're just going to pick him out of everybody. Yeah, it's because, not necessary. Yeah, it wasn't necessary. So he dressed different. So yeah, he was cares. flamboyant. But who was he hurting? I never understood that. So that's when I started to be like, you know, an advocate for for everyone, you know, whether it was mm -hmm. racism or whether it was, uh, you know, having pride or whatever. So, you know, I kind of just be and I think that helped propel my career because, you know, I was speaking out to about things like that where is it the normal male model wasn't thinking about you know mm -hmm. and then i was also going to you know 
movie auditions and because I, I actually started out as an actor before I went to okay. go see my manager, Beth Ann. And, you know, my cousin kept telling me, you should be a model, you should be a model. I said, well, I don't really want to do that because, you know, um, I'm more so into the acting thing. And, you know, ever since I was six years old, I knew that I wanted to do this business. I knew I wanted to get in it. So for me, it was just like, I was just following my dreams since I was six, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I'm living my best life and, you know, things are good. So I can't complain. But yes, on the absolutely. way, though, I, I do stand up and, and fight for equality for all. Uh, fast. Are there any uh, black designers that you support that you'd like to call out quickly? Uh, Laquan Smith. During mm -hmm. this whole pandemic, uh, me and Laquan have been, like, back and forth talking. And, you know, um, I don't know. I just call and check on him, you know, make sure he's good. And, you know, he'll ask me how I'm doing. And we'll just go back and forth. So. Love that. Yeah, yeah so man. In 97, you mm -hmm. went whatever would be considered the word viral back then with Naomi Campbell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how is that iconic shoot like? That's one of the questions I couldn't wait to ask. And that, you know, she has a little bit of a label of a bit of a diva. Was she really cool or what was she like? I thought she was, when you're on set with her, she's so professional. She, mm -hmm. she, she gets the job done. Like when, when Bruce had a shoot, that was amazing. We knew back then how monumental it was going to be, mm -hmm. whether it was going to be for that year that we shot that 97, uh, you know, back then we also, we just knew that later on those images would be, you know, looked at as iconic, you know, when yeah. you look back at them now, they're very iconic. I, I was just talking to her uh, a couple weeks ago and we were talking about life and just, you know, how far we've come and, you know, and I'm, I just keep telling her how proud I am of her and, you know, us continuously still being the king and the queen, you know, <laughs> and it's, and you think about it, what, there's not too many uh, black king and queens of one industry, you know, you have, um, you have the, the basketball players, you have uh, the Williams sisters, you have so many who are on top of their, their, mm -hmm. their, their sport or their, you know, career. And it's it's so rare to see something like that, especially in fashion, which was such or and still is such a racist industry. Uh, me and her still kind of triumphant and we're still on the top in that sense, you know. So I, I, whenever I see a picture of me and her in the, the polo ads, I, I just, you know, I stop, I look at it. I can never get tired of it because I'm so mesmerized by how she looks how we're posed and how, you know, we were captured. It just, it's just iconic. One of my favorite pictures is me and her. Yeah. I love that. Now this one is going to be for my childhood self. This next question. Okay. I can't wait. So how is it like to trade punches with 50 cent in the 21 question? <laughs> uh, well, Curtis, I've known for a while. So when they, they came to me and said, Hey man, we need you to play this role in this video. And I mm -hmm. said, you know what? No problem. I didn't even ask how much I was getting, but um, I remember when 50 came, he came with a nice, 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 really unexpected check, which oh, I nice. didn't expect to get. So it was, nice. it was really fun. And it was two days of filming and, you know, it was really fun working with the guy because he's, he's such a professional. He knows what he wants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're doing the fight scene, a uh, couple takes, I had busted his lip. So then a couple takes later, he paid me back and, oh, and, gave, no. me a good, and gave me a good I'm punch. I'm sure your agent and, was thrilled with that. No, no, we, were, <laughs> we, we knew what it was. We knew what it okay. was. We, we, because in order to make it look real, we were just like, yo, we'll just go half speed is what we call it. Word, word. So we right. went half speed and it, it, looked, it looked good. I mean, there's more to it, but they cut out a lot because it's MTV and we got to, you know, we didn't want to, scare the kitties too much but <laughs> sure. yeah we got it in though because he's 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 about six he's six two i'm almost six two and we're mm -hmm. both we were at the time we we're both around 200 plus pounds so it was it was a good little rumble i mean it got every everybody in the set was like the extras they were like wow you guys is really going at it i said yeah and there's so much of that video that didn't make it but you know it is what it is
wow, that's a classic response and what a yeah, story. <laughs> so I know you, so we mentioned that you were just in the 50 music video. I know you've uh -huh. been in Wu-Tang, Mariah Carey, Tony right. Braxton, Britney Spears, and I can keep on going. Is yeah. there anyone that you haven't worked with in a music video setting that you'd like to? Um, right now, I don't, I don't even know, man. I would have, I would have loved to work with, uh, definitely would have loved to work with Nipsey Hussle for sure oh God, because yeah. he was such a trailblazer and you know um yeah what he stood you know for next would be probably Jay-Z and Beyonce would be something you know I could love to play a villain in a video for those two you know um, yeah so I, I I don't know man that's that's those are probably the two left that I would love to work with yeah cool so I know you were in the cult hit biker boys uh, yeah. Did you ever get to like pick Lawrence Fishburne's brain at all? Do you have any good stories with him? Um, you know what? Me and Lawrence go way back because I remember when I oh, just really? started. Yeah, when I just started modeling. Um, He's one of the best I, actors ever. He really is. I was leaving the, leaving the agency, uh, which was on North Moore Street in New York City. Sure. And I, I was Tribeca. walking down the street. Yeah, you know where it is, right? So yeah. um, Tribeca is like a, a place where you can see almost any actor. So mm -hmm. he was walking down the street and I so happened to be going the same way. And I said to him, hello, you know, we got to talking. And he said, he knew who I was. And he was like, yeah, it's Tyson Beckford. And I said, yeah. He's like, brother, we waiting on you. So, <laughs> you know, come on, let's go. And I remember that conversation and he went his way. I went mine. And it was just like, it stuck with me the whole time. And then we got uh -huh. to working on biker boys the first night on set mm -hmm. and we talked about that and it was just, you know, for me, it was here I am working with Lawrence Fishburne and we both talked about doing this and me getting here and here mm -hmm. I am. So as soon as they said action, you know, my role was, you know, and I was angry in, in my uh, character and then also he was angry in his character. So when, when I did my angry, his angry went up like 10, <laughs> 10 levels. So therefore, my next take, I was like, hold on now. I've got to step mine up because <laughs> he, had, he had shocked us because he went off script, mm -hmm. you know? And then I was like, damn, you can go off script? Okay. <laughs> so my, ne my next line, my next take, I did the same thing. And then he went up again. So I just was like, I can't even match him. So I'm, I'm satisfied with my take, but wow. He came... Uh, from such a different direction from what we all thought he was going to do. And that's, that's Lawrence Fishburne for you, you know? That's talent. And every single take, he came different. And he came with, came with more, more passion. And it just, it, it, he causes you to step up when you're on. Try to call me. <laughs> I'm doing an interview. Stop calling me, people. Yeah, so I that's mean great. that's one of my one of my favorite movies, you know, working on that set and being around motorcycles, so, which I love. Uh you got my next question. Okay, uh, so, did I? You, so you ended up riding a Ducati in uh, Britney Spears' music video. You yes. were in that movie. Yeah. And how did your relationship with Ducati evolve? Uh, and I, here's like a question I've been dying to ask: What's your like? Uh, bike that you would love to just cruise in what's the bike mm -hmm. that you think is like the dope the dopest performance wise and what's the okay. most stylish bike okay um uh i do love my in biker boys i was riding a yamaha r1 which is my other favorite bike mm -hmm. uh in the britney spears video they asked me what bike and i told them what bike so they they were able to find that ducati and it was just amazing um my bike that if I'm going to go cruise across America would be a Harley Davidson um, Road King uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, that'd probably be the bike, either the Road King or, you know, uh, some, a, a bagger of some sort. What's the, nowadays, just, what's yeah, just the most nowadays stylish they have Bluetooth on it. They have stereo systems. You can sit there and ride around. And when I was younger, I used to say, that's the old man bike, you know, but <laughs> I don't know, man. I, when you ride it, you like this. This is comfortable. This is comfortable. I see why the older guys dig it because it's not like you're fighting with the road and the bike. You know, you just all you're doing is cruising. You know, so I, I respect that. But 
the ultimate bike for me, I'd say, is the um, is the new Street Fighter from Ducati. Ducati, which yeah, yeah. I was I was going to get, but the way that the world is going right now, do I really want to make such a big purchase? Because I don't know, man. It just seems like it, we're we're just I don't know. When you think about the Mayans saying the end of the world is near, oh mm -hmm. man, the way that politics are going. Uh, Racism is on the rise. Mm -hmm. You got, you know, uh, white supremacist, Ku Klux Klan, all those things. I'm just like, I think I'm going to hold on to my money for a little bit yeah, and wait, right. you know. And I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of other people are doing the same thing, not running, running out, buying big things. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite bikes. And Ducati said, look, we're going to hold it for you. And my relationship with them, I don't know how it really exactly got started, but... They invited me to the factory in Bologna. Dope. I took the trip. Oh, you know I got on that plane. <laughs> and it was probably one of the longest days because I didn't sleep on the plane. And when I got to Bologna, it was it was probably about 90 degrees at 7 a.m. And for, throughout the rest of the day, the temperature just kept climbing. So I, uh, I went straight to the factory, toured the whole factory, had lunch with the employees, then drove to uh, San Marino, uh, which is a beach town, and went to the racetrack there and Dope. raced the track that day. And I crashed once, I'm not gonna lie, I crashed once. <laughs> but that was because I was so hyper and so excited. Got back up, got on the bike, went back around, went to the, the garage. They gave me a new bike, a bigger bike, sent me back out. I went out, uh, we took amazing pictures. Uh, we then went to the finally made it to the hotel to shower, get ready for dinner. And mm -hmm. I got to dinner. It's probably around eight, nine o'clock now. And I haven't, mind you, I haven't slept since I left JFK. So okay. I'm eating my pasta, talking, drinking wine, and doing this. <laughs> Falling oh, asleep man. in my pasta. <laughs> That's funny. It was incredible. But the next day we got up and we did some more stuff. But I mean, ever since that, the president of Ducati, I have his email. I, I speak to him now and then. And, you know, I was very worried for, for the town of Bologna when, you know, yeah. uh, coronavirus yep. had they spread. But, yeah, they're, they're good now. So right. I'm happy for them. They're, you know, they made it through. And they just did one simple thing. Social distancing, stayed home. When they went out, they wore a mask. And, you know, it's such a simple thing to do that we seem to not be able to do here in America because we're so eager to go out and party and, mm -hmm. you know, live our best life in, you know, uh, 2020 summer, whatever, you know. And mm -hmm. it's sad that, you know, we can't do a simple thing like that, you know. But, yes, people, please be responsible if you're listening. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I've got, I got masks for days. I got... <laughs> uh, Michael Costello sent me so many masks. So thank you to Michael Costello for making me some masks. That you is know. great. Yeah. So you've worked with, like, we already named some of the biggest stars in the world. Uh -huh. uh, is there, like, somebody that sticks out that when you were working with them, they were just at a crazy peak, like, where you even were like, this is crazy? Um. I don't think so. I, I mean, I was there, like, times when Naomi had – like, right after she had thrown the phone, I was, like, working with her, like, a couple... Of, I think I worked with her, like, right after that. And, mm -hmm. you know, once she got the set, she was so cool. I couldn't see where it was. But, you know, I, I, you know, everyone has their temper, you know? So it's just... She wants things done a certain way, so it's got to be done a certain way. So you understand it. Once you know her, you understand it, and you see that it wasn't so much her trying to be a diva, it was more so trying to stand up for things that she believed in, you know? Yeah. And she always makes sure whenever she leaves the house that she's presentable, she looks the the role as a supermodel. You ain't gonna never catch her looking like, I just got out of bed or I'm just wearing sweatpants to the corner store. No, sir, you would <laughs> not catch that lady like that. And I think for the rest of her life, she will be like that. I just want her to have some kids. Because I want to see her in mommy mode. She's done everything else, but I'd love to see uh, Naomi in mommy mode. 
Yeah, and I know that you have a kid, and we're going to talk about that, if you don't mind, in a few. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. So um, I got a man now. He's a man. I know, yeah. and he, play, he has some music, which we're going to ask about in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But anyways, uh, is there any essentials that you have near you that you might be able to show on camera or talk yeah, about? Yeah, I got my – I just came out with this, like, a couple weeks ago. I'm my hand grooming sanitizer. Mine, right? Yeah, yeah, my hand sanitizer, which um, – it was brought to my attention by another male model friend, uh, uh, Don Benjamin. So sure, I, I've actually had, worked with Don before. Have you? He's such yeah. a he's such he's a model art, such a good guy. So yeah. Don was doing it, and then Don said, "Yo, you should try it too." And then he hooked me up with the people. So now you got two male models with the cleanest hands out there. there so you, <laughs> you know, so Don hooked me up, and then. I also came out with my own fragrance, uh, Orion Sky 160 degree latitude. So it has a lot of meaning to me because uh, I'm, I'm into, uh, I don't know if you can see my telescope there. You see my telescope? My hat's yeah. in the way, but. Yeah, I see it. So I, I like to look at the moon and the stars and the constellations. So, you know, Orion's belt was a big deal for me and learning about that as a kid and, you know, uh, Going to going to the planetarium and seeing that I don't even think they take kids to go see that anymore. But that that alone made me want to. I wanted to be a scientist, and then I was like, "Do I be? Am I going to be an actor? Or I'm going to be a scientist." I said, "Well, if I play an actor who's a scientist, then I'm really killing two birds with one stone." So I said, "Okay, I'm going to go with. I'm going to stick with the acting." Did your passion? But I do love science. Okay. I I have a passion for science, though. So did that passion uh, also affect the smell of the fragrance? Because I, I was yeah, yeah, because it's it it's it smells amazing. I th I think so because I went through, I I picked like I went through Ralph Lauren and I went through all these different scents, even Tom Ford, and I said, what if I could mix Bulgari, Tom Ford, and you know Ralph Lauren all in one scent? What would that and a little bit of me? So that's what. That's what Orion Sky is. It's a little Love bit of that. me with the rest of those guys, and just it's like the constellation the, of your people. Yeah, of your, it's of the your people order. I worked with. I think yep. they were my they were my inspiration, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I always said, what would a guy if he was going on a date with a supermodel? What what would he want to smell like? Mm -hmm. So you know that was kind of the idea as well because you want like when you walk by people, they go, wow. That guy smells really good, you know. Like, yep. and you know, it's what it's you, what you want, you know. Especially now that we're closer together, we're in the house together. Is you don't need cologne to go outside, fellas. You can wear <laughs> it in the house. Wear it for her, and that, you know, you want to smell good. And sure. they say certain scents hit the uh, erogenous zone for you know women. So that was another idea that I threw in there. So, fellas, take my advice. Get you some Orion Sky. You won't <laughs> regret it. You'll be, you'll be texting me like everyone else does in my DM, like, wow, this is really good. So people were really blown away by the, the scents for the hand sanitizer yeah. and for Orion Sky. And then I'm wearing my own, my own glasses, you know. But you said to pick something that means a lot to me. And on my neck, I wear my oh, little nice. jade piece. So jade in the Chinese community is, is uh, it means good luck, uh, wealth, um, long life, healthy life. So I consistently wear it times when I feel like the, the energy on the earth is not right. So I wear it for myself, but I also wear it for, you know, good energy for the world, you know. So yes. those are my main things that I, I keep close by. You you've know. been you've been so inspiring so far. I mean, this is just oh, amazing. You, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. keep going. This is incredible. yeah. Let's go. Let's keep going. Right. Until you got to kick me off. Until yeah. oh. they kick us off. Uh, yeah. Until they kick us off. Exactly. Yeah. So I know that you mentioned in the press uh, that some of your your bigger runway days are behind you. But is yeah, there any is there any designer though that you'd come out of the woodwork for? Uh, like a, a like grungy gentleman, the guy you're talking to. <laughs> yeah. I'm, hey, if grungy gentleman needed me, I'm there. Um, if Ralph Warren needed me, I'm there. I'm not, I'm not completely signed off by it, but there's just, I feel like everyone's kind of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when someone decides to do something off the beaten path 
and they want my skills, then I'm going to show up because I feel like I've done everything already. I've shot everything that I've ever wanted to shoot, you Mm -hmm. know? So I get a lot of young photographers asking me if I want to shoot. And of course I'm, I'm flattered, but then, you know, I just decline because there's nothing that they're going to bring to me right now that that's inspiring to me. I, I once had a photographer, and I probably think this is probably the last inspired shoot that I enjoyed shooting was he had me shoot with a, uh, a transgender. And oh. when I got on set, I didn't know it was a transgender. I just, you know, figured it was just a shoot. I said hello to the model and we started talking. And then, you know, we, we, were, we shot what they wanted us to shoot. And then I said to him, there's something I would love to try. Are you down for it? So, and I said, it requires us to be naked. And... I said, okay, I, I, I wanted to do it. And then I asked her if she wanted to do it. And then she was kind of a little bit like, nah, I don't know. Um, but I was like, hey, why not? So then we did uh, some topless ones and we did them in black and white, which I think were such amazing pictures. And then later on, I found out she was a transgender, which didn't make any difference to me because she was an absolute pleasure to work with. But when it kind of got out there in the press, it was, it was first people were like so shocked. And then it was like a delayed embrace. So she was embraced by everyone after that. And, you know, I, I thought that was so cool. And then, you know, I look back at some of the pictures and I'm just like, wow, I did that before it was cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I've pretty much been way ahead of my time with things, you know. And the fact that I didn't know and I didn't care Mm-hmm. is what really, really set it off for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I I treated her as if she was a, a female from birth, you know? It didn't make any difference for me because inside of me, I, I was never taught to, to judge or to hate or discriminate. So for me, it was just like, all right, another day at work, and I accomplished something that I wanted to try. Because I've never, you know, I've had so many photographers, you want to shoot nude, you want to shoot nude? And I've always been like, no, not really. And then I got to the point where, all right, this is the end. I ain't going to have this body forever, so I might as well do it now. So it was one of those kind of things. Like, you know, it was, you know, I don't know you want to call it bucket list, but it was kind of like a bu- bucket list thing. I'd love to shoot uh, some really artsy uh, nudes with Naomi. That would really be incredible, you know. That would be something that if me and she was going to say, okay, this is it. This is our last shoot. Let's get it done before we get too old and <laughs> so that we can look back at this like, you know, 30, 40 years from now and say, wow, we did that. You know, so That's that would great. be something I would love to do. And I don't know who I would ask to want to shoot that, but, you know, we'll figure it out. That's yeah, great. So sure. as far as as far as mentoring other models, is it your duty mm-hmm. to pay it forward? Uh, do you have any advice for people? Um. It's tough because so many people want me to do that, but I kind of still, I'm still like living my dream. So it's kind of hard for me to put my life on pause and then go help you. So I don't know how fair that is. And I don't, I don't really think that I should do that, but I'll give as much advice as I can if I have the time, Mm -hmm. you know? So some people are like, oh, take me under your wing or hook me up with this person. I'm sure. like, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, I'm not going to, hey, Ralph, I got this kid. I'm going to send him over to you. It, it's not really that way for me now because I'm so removed from that world. I, at least in my mind, I am. Um, but, you know, I'm so now so deep into the film and the television that that's what consumes my day, you know, because we're right now, we're writing a script for a scripted TV series I have called Throttle. And we're getting ready to go pitch next week. So, you know, we're, we're kind of like, I'm kind of nervous because this is as far as I've ever gotten with any one of my scripts. And, you know, my writing partners, Adam and Steve, are, we, you know, we're on the phone, we're joking. But then again, we get back to seriousness of, what's what's believable because we want to put out a a series that's believable and Mm -hmm. you know me i want i want some fashion in there i want cars in there i want bikes i want i want models in there i want actresses in there i want to i want to put everybody to work so you know i it's 
how we do it, but we got to be genius about it so that it's realistic and it works with the role because I love for this series to go eight, eight seasons if we can, you know, oh, eight seasons is, is the goal. Yeah. Thank you. So far, so far, everybody loves it and we're getting such a good response. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm very excited about that. So before the pandemic, we were doing this. And then since the pandemic, it's caused everyone to be so much more focused. So um, you think about what we're going through and how you can, because there's going to be two types of people when this thing is over. The ones who took the time to do something productive, create a business, create, you know, whether it's a book or, or you know, seasonings or whatever it is you or the designs of clothes mm -hmm. this is the opportunity it's almost like a restart for everyone you know and you know the stock market is down you can you can jump in and buy you know affordable stuff and then watch it go up I, i've been doing that too because that's my that's my new sports is why is playing the stock market so I'm doing well on the market and I can't complain. And, you know, my script is moving faster than I could ever imagine. So I'm you. really excited right now. Yeah. Good for you. And I hope, to, I hope with all that we're doing that people really see the hard work that we put into it and it's an enjoyable thing. And then hopefully people can come down here to Miami and watch us film, you know, and maybe – we can throw some people in there as extra roles, you know, if you're down here on vacation when once this, you know, uh, pandemic slows down a bit and we can get back to semi-normal kind of living. Look at that, a casting call on, on our show. Yeah, why not? Today. why not? I'm always looking to hire young, young people who want to get a start because, you know, somebody gave me a start. So mm -hmm. in turn, I try to do as much as I can. I can't give everybody a start, but mm -hmm. I can I can give a few. So speaking of that, and I know this is a bit controversial, uh, there's uh -huh. obviously incredibly uh, established models in the industry, but then yeah. there's also a wave of an Instagram model type person. <laughs> so how yeah. do you think that has affected uh, the industry? I've heard you touch on it before, but this is something that I think what you said, a lot of people think. So yeah. can you touch on yeah. that quickly? I think because, because they have so many followers and this mm -hmm. and that, a lot of these companies just go with them. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these people don't know how and what it really takes to be a real model because, you know, we, we would carry our books to go to castings. We would beat the pavement, we, we used to call it. So mm -hmm. here you have these models now that companies are reaching out because they have all these followers. And mm -hmm. it's, it's not really the same for us who have put in the hard work because then you have so many people who are just like, all right, well, we're going to hire this person, but they're going to take a lower rate. So what they've done, what Instagram has done, it's kind of ruined the rate. Whereas it, yeah. if we were getting 10 grand a day, now they can pay somebody a thousand dollars to do what you used to do. And what they'll do is they'll go find a lookalike someone, you know, so it's almost like the person is cutting cutting everyone's throat to get the job. So you're always going to find somebody who's willing to do it for little next to nothing or even nothing, which mm -hmm. you, you ruin the standard that we've worked towards. Because if you think about it, every other um, business has a union. The NFL has a union. Uh, SAG is the actor's union. Models don't have a union. So therefore, we kind of set the rate and our, and our bookers set the rate. So when you have... Instagram models that come in and, and are basically ready to post and put on those clothes for nothing, you know, just for free clothes or just for, you know, uh, to be seen. It really ruins it for the other models that are really out there who went to Paris, who stay, lived in Milan for a year just to build a book, just so they can come back to the States to go to the the top castings, you know, so it, it's kind of, it hurts when you see that for me, I don't really rely on that as an income anymore, like mm -hmm. some models do now, but it, it sucks to see that, you know, because now the day rates are chopped into really nothing, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you can, you can, where you could usually go and do one day rate and live off of that for three, four weeks. You can't do that anymore. Cause the money's next to nothing now. You know, you got mm -hmm. you got a lot of these uh, companies that make these 
not cheap clothes, but um, non-sustainable clothes. So it's clothes that you, you turn around. I mean, yeah, actually, like uh, a lot of the, the women are now modeling for these companies and the product is not high quality like a Issey Laurent or a Ralph Lauren or mm -hmm. a Donna Karen. It's, it's above Target. It's above uh, uh, Kmart, even though those don't exist anymore. It's like you wear it once and then you throw it away. So they just, the most expensive thing that the, that person might have on is the accessories, maybe the watch, maybe the, the purse, mm -hmm. maybe the shoes. And the actual outfit, probably made in, in China somewhere, and it costs, it costs the, 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 the manufacturer $3 tops mm -hmm. to make it. So there's a quick little turnaround there. But in the end, the model is the one who's getting raped, you know. The designer's making a, a ton of money. And they've come to me and asked me if I wanted to do it. But then when I gave them the number that was the fair number for six months advertising for someone at my caliber, they were like, oh, my God, that's too much. I said, that's bullshit because I've seen you pay people who weren't models even more than that. So I didn't call out any names, but, you know, I just was like, okay. And that really, like, was a straw for me that was like, all right, I'm out of here. Um, I can't do this anymore, you know. But when you have a designer like a Ralph Lauren who hits you up and sends you four images that you shot 25 years ago and says, we'd like to use these images. We're going to pay you this much. Is this okay? Then you look at it and you say, yeah, that's – that's a respectable rate. And this is why this guy is king. And this is why I consistently will allow my pictures to be used by him again and again. Mm -hmm. You know, even now there's two, there's, he's, he's using five pictures of mine right now that I shot literally 25 years ago, older wow. than my son, you know? And mm -hmm. if you look at them, still look the same. So they were <laughs> like, we're going to, we want to use them. So they paid me a great rate, you know, and I just said, yeah, for sure. Because I think it helps that the community can look back and see something that they recognize and they can say, you know what? Yeah, that, that's what a real supermodel looks like. So well, I was so answer. happy to do that for Ralph, you know, and I was so, I was so like impressed that so many years later, they'd still come back and ask to use my pictures. No, you know. what, what an answer. So yeah, right? uh, you're, you're from the Bronx. Am I correct by saying that? Yeah, Bronx originally. So yeah. what, makes, what makes you New York? And uh, on top of that, are you a Jada or Dipset fan by any chance? Oh, yeah. Come on now. You can't grow up and not know. Uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy Jones lives down here in Miami sometimes. He was, he was uh, by the way, on a few episodes before yours. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw. I looked at who you had. Yo, yeah. Jim, Jimmy, like, he, did, he was a movement for Harlem. And, you know, uh, Jada, Jada Kiss and, and, you know, the Rough Riders were a huge movement for Harlem as well. So it's so good to see that Harlem is getting some love from, from you know, from the streets like that and to see them as iconic young men who've turned into businessmen today. It's, I'm, I'm really proud of them because I remember seeing them in the neighborhood and, you know, they were doing their thing and their music was just, it was everything. And then uh, Cam asked me to jump in his uh, horseless carriage video. And I said, you know what, Cam, I got you. I'm, I was on my way to a party, but I'm going to stop. And I jumped in this video. So, I have much respect for Dipset and all of them and growing up in, you know, growing up in New York. And what makes me a New Yorker is that we're resilient. You know, when, when the pandemic hit New York, New York was like, okay, we're going to listen to Governor Cuomo. He's going to give us the best advice and the right advice. They did that. They followed direction. Now look at New York. It, it was the epitome of this coronavirus in the U S now we here in Florida have picked it up. Now, Texas has it. California has it because mm -hmm. we have governors that didn't believe in wearing masks. They didn't. They opened up too soon. Where is it? Um, Cuomo knew not to do that. He listened to the experts. He listened to the scientists. It, it's so easy because you have to say, 
if somebody has gone to school for this many years and has been studying and living and eating and just always, you know, in the laboratory looking at these infectious diseases, I'm going to listen to them before I listen to a guy who went to a, a, a small college, you know. It's almost like, all right, we go to the airport. Are you going to let just anybody jump in the cockpit and fly the plane? No, no you're, you're not. not. You're no. not. You're going to let the expert pilot who's put in X amount of hours doing it and years doing it before you let some, some joker who was drinking at the bar with you fly the plane. And it's such a simple thing to understand. So I don't understand why some people say, oh, it's a made-up virus. It's not real. And I'm like, you, have, you obviously have no idea about biology and science. So, you know, I grew up loving science myself as a kid and understanding that viruses can, you know, mutate into things that we don't want them to, you know. Um, they even say there's probably another swine flu that's getting ready to come out that's even worse than the first one. So I don't know, man. People just got to start listening to the listening to the scientists and understanding what we're doing and what we need to stop doing to the earth. So, you know, they're so, going to learn. And it's sometimes some people have to learn the hard way. And it's totally. sad, but we we have a leader that doesn't understand science. He doesn't care for science. Mm -hmm. He doesn't he doesn't even believe in global warming. So why is he going to believe in this? It won't he won't believe it till it happens and it hits home. And, you know, a worst case scenario, I, I kind of wish that he would get the coronavirus so he could feel like what other people are going through, you know, because it, it, it's really not anything to be played around with. And we have a, a lifetime, maybe if we listen to these scientists to to go to the bars, go to the clubs, do all those things, get back to normal or what we think is normal. We just have to take the time to listen sit down and just pay attention and you know wear the mask the protection do all the things that you're supposed to do like me i hardly go outside <laughs> i mean i was already on that personally but you know now i'm really no, you're, li you're listening to the protocol you're being yeah no i'm listening to the protocol i go outside i wear gloves i wear i wear a mask i mm -hmm. wear eye protection sometimes and just people are like you know people here in in, in miami are like where are you going you go, you're gonna you're gonna do a murder while you got on those gloves? I said, No, I just I'm just being safe, you know. I don't know where you've been. I don't know who you talked to or who you've been around. So, you know, and the and the common thing is, for real? But you know me. I know you, but I don't know where you've been. That's you know, true. I don't know who you've come in contact with. I don't you know, so you you gotta be you gotta be safe and you gotta be smart, you know? Yep. It's not like you're gonna jump in a, a tank of sharks, you know knowing that you can get killed or you can take the choice of staying on shore. I'm going to take the choice of staying I'm on shore. shore. I'm not also. jumping I'm in with you. the sharks. <laughs> yeah. It's not worth it to take a chance. It really isn't. And, and I try to tell that to all my followers and stuff. It's, you know, create something at home, stay at home. Yep. It's just yep. safer. You know, I, if you don't I have agree. to go outside, don't go outside because there's really nothing to do. You know, you can go outside, you can walk around, you can work out and then pretty much, you can't really go anywhere to eat anymore. You can't you can't go hang out anymore anywhere. There's no no real clubs open, but the crazy thing is strip clubs are open in Miami. Oh god. I don't understand it. <laughs> I don't understand it. And people are flocking to go there. I don't understand this generation's need to go outside to hear music. I can stay inside and play the same music that the DJs are playing. And make my own bar at home. Not that I drink, but I'd make my own bar at home and have fun. And, you know, you could run around naked in your house. No one cares. But, you know, you can't do those things in the club. And you don't have to wear a mask when you're in your house. But, you know, hopefully people wise up and say, okay, we need to change this administration. And we need to go out and vote. We need someone who's going to tell us the right thing to do and how to protect ourselves. Because if we had followed Germany and all the other countries and listened We'd be out of this. We'd be enjoying our best summer right now. True. Really. True. Yeah. So changing gears quickly. Sure. Uh, what was your first, I guess, big spend when you got your first big check? And what's your current biggest flex to this date? Okay. My big spend when I got my first check, I bought a used Honda uh, F2 uh, motorcycle. 
when That's I got actually my pretty first... cool though. Yeah. I yeah. bought it used because I wanted to make sure that I was going to love it because I started off on dirt bikes. So I never had a street bike. So when I bought my first street bike, it was just like, okay. And then I quickly sold that one and got it you know, upgraded to a bigger. I went 600, 750 to 1,000. So I worked my way up. I wasn't one of those who was like, I'm going to go buy 1,000 because it's the big bike. No, I worked my way. I learned. And that's probably why I'm safe rider to this day. Um, okay. So for one birthday, I really splurged. I bought a Jeep Wrangler. Nice. I bought a Ducati. Okay. And then my girlfriend at the time bought me a four wheeler. So happy birthday that was probably, to you. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Cause my birthday is December 19th, which is like, it's weird because Christmas is five days later and no one wants to give me anything. I mean, Christmas is seven days later. So no one really wants to, they don't have any money to give me anything else. So I always have to buy my own gift. So there you yeah, go. I do that sometimes. And then I'll wrap it up and I'll open it like somebody else came and it. But I've been doing that since I was young. So, you know, I can't help that. Love it. So Instagram is only allowing us four more minutes, but I'm going know, down. We gotta get off but I'm soon. going down to the wire if you're cool Okay, let's that, go. Okay. So yeah. um, I, I kind of know a little bit of this answer, but do you okay. consider yourself uh, more of a watch guy, a car guy, or a cigar guy? Damn. <laughs> I have to say I'm a watch and car guy. Okay. Car first, watch second. And I haven't, since this pandemic started, I had actually stopped smoking cigars in uh, late October of last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't had one since. Okay. Yeah. And I live above a cigar bar. <laughs> oh, wow. I so love... I have to walk by these bastards every day smoking cigars. And they're like, oh, you're not going to join us today? And I'm just like... I've been saying it for over six months now. No, no, I'm not smoking cigars anymore. So what's so, your top car brands and what are your top watch brands? Right now, I'm in love with the, F the F12 Ferrari Berlinetta. So I say Ferrari. And then I'm also in love with the Nissan GTR Nismo. So I have to say Nissan and Ferrari are my two biggest. And then Rolls Royce, my third. And watch is... I'm looking at a Sky Dweller in rose gold. Okay. I have one in gold already. And then I have a, a nice uh, deep sea in stainless steel. So now I'll, nice. I need a rose gold. I need a rose gold in my nice. life. So my birthday is coming up. I'm going to be 50. So I think I should have bought the, the gold one for this year. Uh -huh. And then I, I did it the back ways. I did it backwards. So. Yeah, wow. now I have to buy the rose gold for myself. So, got yeah. it. So, being yeah. that you're turning fifty, uh, uh -huh. how have you stayed in shape during quarantine? I mean, that must not be as easy. Uh, I'm gonna try to show you. Okay. See my my bike, my jump rope, yep. and then my old man rocking chair right there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'll I'll hit that can stay right there, and I can pedal right there in the living room and uh -huh. watch TV. And then the jump rope, I get on the balcony and I do. And then when I'm done jump roping, I sit in that old man rocking chair and just rock until I get my breath back and then get back on it again. So last night I was jumping rope till about 11. And then I got, got on it. the scale and the scale said I lost three, 3.7 3 pounds. Wow, that's pretty in, impressive. In two days. No, wow. in, in one day because I weighed myself Sunday. And then, yeah, it's roughly around two days. So, yeah. All right. So, Tyson, we got 45 seconds left. So, okay, if you can answer this question within 45 seconds, go. just name what is the best party you have ever been to in your life? Damn. <laughs> That's hard. Probably my own birthday party. Okay. Yeah. I gave uh, this, these publicists $25,000 to throw myself my own birthday party, and it was the best. I rode in a helicopter. Arrived wow. at the party, it was in the airplane hangar, and I had a good time. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Tyson, you have been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, you can check out the full episode on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or our website. You're the man, and hope to do this again soon. You're the man, Grungy. All right. Appreciate it, man. Speak to you soon. Love you, brother. Be good.